It's the last laugh. In other words, God laughs last. <laughs> he gets the last laugh. And uh, someone asked me one time, did Jesus ever smile? Well, of course he did. He was a human being. He had the joy of the Lord. What do you think? The joy of the Lord makes you sour. And of course he had joy and he smiled and uh, smiled at little kids and, and smiled on sinners uh, when they repented and trusted him. He was a human being like you. He had feelings. And, uh, you know, you're not spiritual because you don't smile, nor are you spiritual because you smile. But you ought to learn to smile, amen? Uh, we tell our folks here at Open Door, you know, you ought to smile. Just smile all the time. People don't want to what you're up to, you know. They say, Boy, he's up to no good, so you ought to learn how to smile, you know. I don't know why. You know, rebellious teenagers are the ones that won't smile. Folks that want to act tough are the folks that won't smile. People think, if I, well, if I smile, I won't look tough, you know. If I look mad, I'm tough. Well, you're not tough because you're mad. You're not weak because you smile. So get over yourself. All right? So here in this second psalm, uh, let's read it together. And uh, I want you to notice some things, and I'll say a few things about it tonight. And hopefully I'll say something that will be of help to you. It says, Why do the heathen rage? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves together, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, let us cast their cords far from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. There it is. You want to know where God laughs? Right there. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Uh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Now that tells you what kind of laugh it is. It's a deriding laugh. It's a laugh of, 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 of mockery. It's that kind of laugh. It's a, a laugh at their foolish attempts. Uh, then uh, shall he speak to them, in verse 5, Then shall he, God, speak to them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me. That's interesting. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Let's pray. Now, Father, I pray that you'll help me with this message tonight. I pray you'll help us to have ears on our souls so that we can hear what the Spirit says to us, not only as a group, but individually. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now, there's several things in this, uh, in this passage. In fact, there are four different voices expressing themselves in this psalm. There are four different voices expressing themselves as you read this psalm. And in verse 4 through 6, you certainly have the voice of God speaking of reproof and retribution. In verses 4 through 6, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh, the Lord shall have them. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and say in verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So God the Father is speaking there. Then you have the voice of Christ speaking, the ruler, and, uh, and uh, you'll notice that he's speaking of of rule and relationship. Look at 7 through 9. I will declare the decree. That's a quote. That's Jesus quoting the Father. I will declare the decree the Lord said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. That's the Son speaking. That's Jesus Christ speaking. Ask of me, the Father said, the Son now is quoting, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. So you have God the Father speaking, and now you have the Son speaking. And then you also have the voice of the Spirit speaking uh, down in uh, verse uh, 12 and 13. And uh, there he's speaking of receiving and rejoicing in verse 12 and 13. That's the Holy Spirit speaking saying, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Holy Spirit's the author of the Bible. Okay? And then there's a fourth one. I didn't mention that at the beginning, but it's the voice of the world speaking 
in rejection and rebellion, and that's up in verse 1 and uh, 1 through 3. He says, why do the people, why do the heathen, the heathen here are Gentiles, and the people are the Jews, that's Israel. And both of them really were against Jesus Christ. Rome, the Gentiles were against Christ, and the religious leaders were against Christ. So one refers to the heathen, the Gentiles, and the people, Israel, they imagine a vain thing. And uh, verse 2, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder, let us cast their cords away from us, and so on. So you have these four different voices speaking uh, in this psalm. Some people have used, I've had them to use verse 8 as a missionary promise. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that would be a good verse to pick for a missionary promise, but I had a missionary a few years ago to come through, and that was the verse on his prayer card. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. So he saw that as a prayer promise to where if he asked God, God would give him the heathen, uh, wherever he was going, uh, as an inheritance. But that's quite a stretch on this verse because this is not talking about a missionary promise. This is talking about God the Father telling God the Son, you ask me and I will give thee, actually give you the earth for your inheritance. And that is what's going to happen. This psalm here is a messianic psalm. It's about Jesus Christ. And it is pro prophecy. It is going to be fulfilled in the tribulation. This psalm has never been fulfilled. Now, it was quoted in the book of Acts. When Peter and the people were praying in the early part of the book of Acts, uh, he quotes this text, how the heathen rage and the kings set themselves and so on. But he quotes something, but just because he quoted it, it wasn't the fulfillment of the text. You understand? Many times we quote things in our practical life or practical application, but that doesn't mean that that scripture is finalized when we quote it. Does that make sense to you? How many of that did not make sense? Okay, buy my tape. Uh, no, uh, all I'm saying is this. There are prophecies and promises in the Bible that we sometimes quote and claim, which may be okay. But nevertheless, that your, uh, your uh, uh, application of that promise to your life is not the fulfillment of that promise, nor the direction of that promise. The promise may be promised to Israel. It may be a promise to Jesus Christ himself. So, in the book of Acts, Peter quotes this text, but it was not the fulfilling of the text, or the fulfillment of the text. The text has not been fulfilled. And uh, it will take place in the tribulation period. And it will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ returns at the second advent. When he says, Thou wilt, uh, he will rule them with a rod of iron. Jesus is not ruling anybody or anywhere today with a rod of iron. You understand? You have a perfectly free will to live for Jesus Christ today if you want to. Or you can rebel if you want to. Nobody is forcing you to do anything. He is not forcing the nations to serve him. They do what they want to. But the time is going to come when people will be forced to be obedient to the laws of the kingdom. And it'll be heavy, heavy, hangs over your head if you don't. Because it's going to be a dictatorship. He shall rule with a rod of iron. It's not going to be a democracy. We're not going to vote every hundred years about whether Jesus is going to rule or reign. Amen. You understand? It's going, to be a, it's going to be a dictatorship. It'll be a benevolent dictatorship, but he'll rule with a rod of iron. In fact, you read in the book of Revelation that those who overcome rule with him as kings and priests. Okay? So I want to talk to you about this, about this uh, heathen raging here in verse 1, the heathen raging. It's sort of, sort of like a... It's sort of, he, he likens it to an ocean, to a storm. And uh, the, you'll, you'll read many times in the Bible about uh, so-and-so coming down out of the north like a storm. Uh, the book of Revelation, he, the angel is told to hold back the four winds until certain people are sealed. I think you have that in chapter 7, where the 144,000 and the angels are told to hold the four winds until I've sealed my servants. 
in their forehead. What's the wind that he's to hold back? It's coming judgment. It's a storm that's going to be unleashed upon planet earth. And it'll, the storm will be the heathen of the world as they join together to settle things over there in the Middle East. And that's, that's what's going to happen. And uh, here in just a few weeks, uh, we're going to start our study in the book of Revelation. And I'll be teaching it every Sunday night. I hope you'll come. I've been preparing and studying and I'm enjoying the research and putting things together. And, uh, you know, if you could just get half the blessing that I'm getting out of the research, you would be blessed. And uh, the Sunday night before the series starts, uh, I've got a, uh, a video I want to show you that I ordered uh, off a program I saw on television. It's a documentary. It's called Israel's Coming War. And I've already viewed it, and uh, I want to show it to you. It's about an hour long, and uh, it shows the battle that is brewing between the Orthodox Jews and the secular Jews. And you need to see that because this is the prelude to the, to the persecution that is going to come to these Orthodox Jews uh, by the secular Jews and by the one-worlders over there. Uh, and that is, that's on the way. And the, but the greatest persecution of the Orthodox Jews will be their own people, the secular Jews. They don't believe in God. Most of them are one-worlders. Many of them are communists. They're not nationalists. They don't, they don't care about Israel. They spit on Israel. Why? It's not, to them, it's not about a piece of dirt. It's about a one-world dictatorship. Does that make sense to you? The only, the only people that land is valuable to are the Orthodox Jews and the Muslims. Those are the two people that believe that land belongs to them. These secular Jews, they don't care about that. They may milk it to get what they want or to create strife and revolution, but they don't believe they don't believe God. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe the promises of Jesus Christ. They don't believe the Messiah is coming. They don't believe any of that stuff. They, there are a lot of atheistic Jews. So the heathen are going to rage, especially in this coming uh, battle, and uh, as, especially as the ten kings get together uh, over there in that part of the world. And this, uh, this battle is going to center around Palestine and the surrounding nations over there. It, uh, I hope it doesn't involve America. Of course, we have a way of getting involved in everything. But, uh, but that's going to be the center of it, is in that part. I want you to turn to Isaiah 57 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 20. And uh, I just want to use a verse here. Just, uh, it's, it's a verse I think you need to underline or note it in your Bible because it'll help you to understand the, uh, uh, the agitation of the wicked nations as we get closer and closer uh, to the coming uh, 70th week of Daniel. Isaiah 57 and verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea uh, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up dirt and mire. And uh, so when he talks about the, uh, the nations uh, uh, raging and so on, he's talking about it's like, a, it's like a boiling ocean with the waters just churning up dirt and mire. And uh, that is going to be the spirit of the nations and the world as we move more and more toward that Daniel 70th week. Jesus calls it perplexity of nations. Perplexity. Uh, did you ever see a lion or a tiger uh, in a cage just walking back and forth and back and forth, looking for a way out, just back and forth, can't find an exit, just back and forth? Uh, that's ultimately is where, we, where the nations are going. They can't find an answer. They can't find a solution. And uh, so, you know, they just become uh, lawless. And you have anarchy around the planet. Now, you'll see not only this raging is a result, really, in verse 2 and 3, of a rebellious heart. In verse 2 and 3, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together. Now, remember in Psalm uh, chapter 1, it said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So there may be in God's mind a connection between these two psalms. In other words, the nations that are not involved in the council here against Israel are going to be blessed. But those nations that gather together 
and uh, as ungodly to destroy Israel, and they counsel here on how to do it, uh, you know, uh, they are like the chaff which the wind driveth away there in that first psalm. And, uh, but their counsel is against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, how is that going to take place? Are they going to direct their wrath directly at God? I doubt it, because there's nothing they can do to God. How, where would you shoot if you were going to shoot God? If you were going to attack God, which way would you jump? Where would you shoot a missile? And then against his anointed. Well, he, he, at this time, he's still seated in heaven. So they sure can't touch him. But then this word anointed, even though it's talking specifically about Jesus Christ, I think it's also talking about the nation of Israel. In other words, remember the Bible said uh, when, when Paul was persecuting believing Jews, these were Jews he was persecuting, not Gentiles. He, went into, he had letters to the synagogue to arrest Jews. And when Paul was arrested himself on the Damascus Road, the Lord asked him, uh, Paul, why persecutest thou me? Paul didn't have a clue what he was talking about. And yet, Paul was arresting Christians and killing them. But indirectly, he was persecuting Jesus Christ. So these who set themselves against God and against the heavens really are attacking, I believe, the righteous Jews, the Orthodox Jews, during this tribulation period. They're going to they're put a stop to these Jews that are trying to build the temple and uh, trying to establish the land and fighting to keep the land and going around and preaching and stirring up trouble among their own people by telling them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, just like was going on in the book of Acts. Does that make sense to you? That's the kind of thing that's going to be going on. And so, indirectly, it is at the Lord Himself, but directly, it is right at God's people. That's how you hurt God today. You hurt people within the church. The church is the body of Christ. And so, what you and I do to the members of the body of Christ, we do to Christ. It's His body. So I think that's what's talking about. And, you know, and this shows the heart of these people because the counsel comes out of the heart. And they are going to, their, their, uh, their, um, their counsel is to break their bands asunder and cords. This is any hold that these people might have or any hold that uh, are control that they might have or try to exert or influence. I think the chords is talking about the influence and the power. Because once again, God always works through His people. Now, in the, in the, even in the tribulation, I know that God rains fire from heaven. He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah without the help of anybody. I'm aware of that. But in most cases, God's battles are fought through His people. That is the normal way He does it. And I know from Zechariah and other prophecies that there's going to be a remnant of Jews that will fight. They will be, they will be, uh, you know, they will be the Marines uh, of that time. And it says one shall chase a thousand, and two ten thousand. That's talking about these fighting Jews. So there's going to be, during this tribulation period, God is going to have a band, an army of Jews that are going to fight. This is going to be a real war. God's not going to do it all miraculously. There's armies that come out of the east. There's armies that come from the north. These are real armies. And God will use them to accomplish His will, and then He will step in miraculously and deliver Israel before they are totally destroyed. Otherwise, there would be no hope for them. But in most cases, most cases, all through the Bible, God used natural means to accomplish His purpose. But He can all, always intervene. He always has and does and will when necessary. Does that make sense to you? 
the natural mean of having childbirth is a man and a woman and a baby. But God did interrupt that once. See? In fact, He interrupted it twice. In fact, He interrupted it three times. Yeah, He had a man without a woman. And he had a woman without a woman, just a man. And then he had a man by a woman without a man. Didn't he? Do you need help? Well, he had Adam without a woman. He had Eve through a man without a woman. And he had Jesus Christ through a woman without a man. So I guess he can interrupt the natural means when it is necessary. But in most cases, <laughs> there's a natural child, way of childbirth. And so in most cases, God will use armies and He will even use Israel in this period of time. But when He needs to, to spare Israel from total destruction, He will, he will intervene. So these, uh, these, uh, these uh, nations, uh, they have a heart of rebellion against God. Let's go to Luke 19. Let me show you a verse here. I think it'll illustrate uh, what we're trying to say. Luke chapter 19. And I want you to look down at about verse 14. Luke 19, 14. And this, uh, this illustrates the attitude that existed when Jesus came the first time. We, Israel, will not have this man to reign over us. Well, they will display as a nation this same attitude again. The same spirit, same attitude is going to take place again in the, in the near future. We will not have this man to reign over us, and that's a heart of rebellion. Now, I want you to notice heaven's retribution in verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh.